Good morning or good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for the webinar, Prenatal to Three, Translating the Science and Evidence to State Policy. I am Allison May, and I'm an Early Care and Education Policy Associate here at the National Conference of State Legislatures, or NCSL for short. In addition to our expert presenter, who I'll introduce in just a moment, I am joined on the webinar today by my colleague, Donna L. Wilson. Before we get started, I'd like to take a moment to share a bit of background on NCSL. We are a bipartisan membership organization that serves the legislators and legislative staff from all states, commonwealths, and territories. As a legislator or staff, you are automatically an NCSL member, and we are here to serve and support you. While we do not advocate for certain policies, NCSL does provide research, technical assistance, and opportunities for policymakers and staff to exchange ideas and learn from experts and one another. We are joining you today from our office in Denver, Colorado, where the policy research staff is headquartered. We also have an office in Washington, D.C., where our colleagues advocate at the federal level on behalf of states' rights and interests, and keep federal policymakers informed of the innovative work you're all doing in your state. Today's webinar is a platform for information exchange. There will be an opportunity to ask questions at the conclusion of the presentation. To ask a question, simply type it in the chat box located in the bottom left-hand side of your screen. Uh, we had an incredible amount of interest in the webinar today, and I know that there are many of you on the line. I already see a handful of you saying hello and sharing what state you're from, but I would welcome others on the line um, to type in the state uh, in the chat box the state from which you're joining us so we can see everyone that's on the webinar today. Um, as people, that's great, as people keep um, typing the state that they're coming from, I want to just draw your attention to a few of the resources on the screen that you see in front of you. Um, at the top of the presentation, you'll see a uh, tab that says resources, or just resource perhaps, and in there you're going to find a PDF version of the PowerPoint we're using. Under the speaker tab, you can also find full presenter bios. You can access these tabs at any time during the webinar today. I'll also note that the webinar is being recorded and will be available as a video archive uh, in about a week on NCSL's website. I know that prenatal to three policies are being discussed in many states and state houses, especially during this legislative session, and I'm so thankful for the generous support of our funder. Um, NCSL acknowledges and thanks the Pritzker Children's Initiative for financially supporting our work. The Pritzker Children's Initiative is building a promising future for our, for our country through investments in early childhood development. They support efforts to better understand the impact of policies and programs on the developmental outcomes of at-risk infants and toddlers. Our partnership with the Pritzker Children's Initiative has produced a handful of resources that many of you on the line might find helpful. Uh, just last month, we hosted a very well-received symposium in Austin, and all the meeting materials are available on our website. NCSL authored a report and policy guidebook last year, one exploring the effects of maternal depression, and the other a guidebook for state policymakers thinking about policy solutions related to prenatal history topics. And finally, our webpage takes a look at prenatal to three policies, breaking it into key areas such as the experience of parents, home visiting, promoting access to high quality settings for infants and toddlers, well-being and developmental screenings, and of course, funding. I hope that some of these resources will be helpful to the work that you are doing in your state for infants and toddlers. So we're really excited to have with us today a dynamic expert presenter. Uh, Cynthia Osborne is Associate Dean at the University of Texas at Austin LBJ School of Public Affairs and Founder and Director of the Child and Family Research Partnership. She leads the new National Prenatal to Three Policy Impact Center, a resource for policymakers on evidence-informed state policies that strengthen outcomes for infants and toddlers. You can access Cynthia's full bio at the top of your webinar platform. 
Uh, and just a fun fact, uh, Cynthia, or an interesting fact perhaps, Cynthia previously taught middle school in a low-income community in California. I think with that, Cynthia, I'll go ahead and turn the floor over to you, and if you need any help with your slides, just let us know and we can do so. Great. Thank you, Allison. I really appreciate it. And I am very grateful for the opportunity to share more about our uh, new Prenatal to Three Policy Impact Center. Our goal is to be a resource for states as they develop and implement policies that try to strengthen the Prenatal to Three system of care. And so to have the opportunity to speak with so many folks across so many different states that I see um, at, in the chat box, it's really a, a pleasure and a great opportunity. I want to um, start by saying that our work is really guided by the science of the developing child. The science is clear that the prenatal to three period is the most sensitive period of brain development, and it's the time in which our brains are developing the most rapidly. Our brain is the only organ in our body that is not fully developed when we're born. Our new newborn's tiny little hearts and lungs are just like they're going to be when they become the bigger version, but our brains have to be built. They are expecting input from our environment. And to help them to build the areas at different periods of time over the first three years of whether it's language or vision or higher orders of function, but it's expecting this input from our caregivers to help to build that foundation and strengthen the connections so that um, it is fully formed um, over the course of our lives. But by the time that we're three, and especially by the time we're five, most of the brain is set, and from then on out, the pace is much more slow. And what we know is that if we get it right in these earliest years, that it really lays the foundation for all future learning and behavior and health, that it makes both the well-being of an individual better off over the course of their life, and from a society perspective, it's actually a lot less expensive and a lot better for all of us if we get it right in the earliest years and it, with these long-term payoffs over a life course. So the science is really clear that we know what children need to thrive and that if children don't get these safe, stimulating, loving, caring environments in their earliest years, that it actually impairs the development of their brain and it puts a lot of strain on their physiological systems that over time lead to uh, poor health behaviors and other sorts of outcomes. This chart that you see is just a um, depiction demonstrating how at different periods of our earliest development our brain is expecting to have these sorts of influences and inputs uh, because that's a time in which it's trying to uh, really uh, strengthen those connections and build that foundation. You can see from it begins before we're born and in that first year, in the first couple of months, it's really laying the pathways for our vision and our hearing. By the time that we're eight or nine months old, it's really expecting that our language pathways have been pretty well fortified. And by the time that we're three years old, that that's the time in which our brain is expecting that prefrontal cortex to be um, strong and, and to have had that kind of stimulation and input so it lays that foundation for us to be able to make decisions, to delay gratification for little ones, to sit still or to follow directions. These are the things that are built over time with input and stimulation from our caregivers. Um, and if our brains don't get that, it makes it much more difficult uh, for children to have these sort of higher uh, cognitive functioning and executive functioning skills. This graph shows that it really is about our environment that shapes our brain's development. When we talk about gray matter or frontal gray matter, this is kind of all the um, wrinkles and so forth that happen within our brain that make it a healthy brain where it is uh, neurons and dendrites are firing and especially in this prefrontal cortex with this frontal gray matter that's what we want to see developing in children and we want it to be uh, really fully formed by the time that they are three years old but you can see that kids start off 
with similar levels of gray matter, regardless of their parents' socioeconomic status. But over the course of those first three years, children in higher socioeconomic uh, environments are getting more stimulation. They're exposed to lower levels of stress, uh, more consistent resources and stability in their environments. And that leads to more uh, de uh, stronger development of that prefrontal cortex. You can see that children in, uh, with middle levels of income and lower levels of income don't receive the same sort of stimulation on average. And therefore, by the time that they're three years old, the um, kind of all the wrinkles that we want to see in the brain are much stronger for those who are raised in higher resource environments than those in lower resource environments. What's great about brain development is that it, despite the fact that our neuroscientists are brilliant, what they're actually telling us is that it's pretty simple about what children need to thrive, that there isn't some magic um, you know, uh, pill that we have to give them or uh, technology or certain things that have to take place in order for children to thrive. It really is simple. They need a safe, stable, caring, loving interactions with their caregivers um, and that that leads to healthy brain development. Despite the fact that it's simple, it doesn't mean that it's easy. And it, some, for some families, it's very complex that when you have to work several different jobs or there's maternal depression or substance use or other sorts of things that make it difficult for parents to provide these environments for their children, that um, that's when our children, our, our earliest infants and toddlers, are not getting off to the best start that we want them to and that the parents want them to. So our parents do need the resources and the skills and the health and social connections that lay that foundation and the, uh, create those conditions in which their children thrive. And we know from all sorts of research that policies can actually help to create those conditions for families and that they can make it so that families are exposed to lower levels of stress, that have greater stability in their resources, and that the children live in safer environments. This picture here is just a very simplistic logic model that just demonstrates what I've been saying, that the conditions in which children thrive are when the parents have access to economic security, stable housing, stable food, when the caregivers themselves have uh, high levels of physical and emotional and mental health, they're in healthy relationships, and that they understand and have the skills and knowledge and time to provide that uh, warmth and uh, interaction, serve and return, uh, strong attachments between them and their children. And that what our job is, is to identify the policies that help to create these conditions in which we know that parents and their children will thrive. So that is the goal of our center, is to identify the most effective policies that help to get us to those goals. And those goals are driven by science, and are, uh, we are not at all neutral to those goals because we know that those matter so deeply for, their, for children. What we are neutral to is the strategies that, try, that um, will get us there that we are starting with the evidence and seeing what do we know and what don't we know in terms of what will be the most effective strategies to creating those conditions. Like I said earlier, our goal is to be a trusted resource for states as you develop and implement policies that try to bring to life the science of the developing child and to be this um, authoritative source of information that says, here's what we know about the evidence base and here's what we need to still learn. There are a lot of amazing folks in this space doing work that uh, is really improving the lives of uh, parents and infants and toddlers. And we want to work um, collaboratively with all of you uh, to help to foster the exchange of information between policy and practice and research. Sometimes we as researchers sit outside and um, act as if we're not engaged in what's going on on the ground. And we want to be uh, in these conversations, learning from what's happening on the ground, learning from those who are adopting and implementing policies, and to continue to collaborate with the researchers. Like I said, our goals are driven by the science, that we know that in order for children to thrive, they need to be born healthy and have healthy parents. And any needs that they have need to be identified early and 
address that that will actually make it so that over time that those needs are um, ameliorated. We know that parents need uh, resources and knowledge and skills to be able to, par to be the parents that they want to be and that their children need. And that when children are not with their families that they have access to a high quality learning environments that are affordable and that they are trusting and that they're safe. So those are the three different focus areas of um, the Policy Impact Center. And um, as I said, our goal is to try to identify the most effective policies that will bring to life those goals. And our Impact Center has three guiding principles that we rest on quite heavily. And the first is that, as I've been saying, the science is very clear that investing early is really essential uh, for long-term payoffs and it, um, making sure that children get off to a healthy start, but that we can't just invest in children. We have to invest in their families and in the institutions that serve them in order to ensure that children do get off to a healthy start. Um, children don't get to make their own choices in their, when they're infants and toddlers, and it's their parents and the institutions that serve them that need to be um, there for them and able to do um, for them the way that the children need. We also want to make sure that when we're trying to um, get kids off to a healthy start that we really are thinking about all children, that all children need to thrive. And historically, we have seen uh, pretty large and persistent disparities and who is thriving by the time that they show up for kindergarten, whether they're ready to learn and whether they're healthy. And these disparities exist across the life course. And so we want to identify policies that are effective at um, making the conditions in which children thrive come to life, but we also want to pay particular attention as to whether there are policies that will help to close the gaps across race and ethnic groups, across socioeconomic statuses. And finally, I'm an academic, so I live and breathe by research and evidence. And although we are guided by the evidence, we are very mindful of the fact that there are limits to our evidence base, that we cannot say everything about everything yet, that it needs to be built. And um, in order for that to happen, there are going to have to be states and others that try and, uh, by adopting effect or innovative strategies that we will be able to evaluate and learn from over time. So uh, we want to make sure that we are as honest and transparent about what we know and about what we don't know so that we can try to build the evidence base. The Policy Impact Center is working to uh, provide four different resources to the uh, prenatal to three field. Um, and I'm going to talk about each of these in turn. The first is what we're calling our policy evidence review. And you think of this as a clearinghouse of social policies that will help us to understand what do we know about this policy and what don't we know and how effective is it at meeting, um, at, when we think about that logic model, at really helping to move some of those uh, outcomes within that logic model. And um, most of the clearinghouses that exist, if you are familiar with them, typically focus on programs or approaches. Sometimes they're there to just say whether a study was a strong study or not. But there are no clearinghouses, to, to my knowledge, that really focus on state-level policies. And I will talk a little bit about the criteria that we have for thinking about the policies that we are reviewing and then whether we can say anything meaningful about them. The first, and we have a list of about 50 different policies that we have collected by talking to lots of folks across the country, um, and the list will continue to evolve. So I uh, strongly encourage you to reach out to us and to let us know about policies that you and your state are trying um, and that you would like to know more about, and we can tell you whether or not they're in our queue for review or not and um, put them there if they aren't. Um, but the three criteria are, one, the policy must try to actually move the mark uh, of this logic model that I was referring to earlier. It has to, um, in theory, uh, try to improve the outcomes of 
um, parents of infants and toddlers or of infants and toddlers themselves or of the institutions that serve them. So we begin by looking at what is the theory of change here? What is it intending to do? And how does it fit within that logic model? And the second is that we are just looking at state level policies at this time. We're not looking at specific programs. That's something that, like I said, a lot of different um, groups have done and the clearinghouses are there to provide that sort of feedback on them. Um, and, but still, state level policies come in lots of different forms. It can be that states have a policy to fund an evidence-based program like a home visiting program. It could be that they are implementing a federal policy, but that they have state discretion in terms of who's eligible or what the benefit level will be or how uh, simple or uh, burdensome recertification is. So uh, there's often a lot of leverage in uh, federal policies that states have. And the third type of policy is that states can just simply develop their own sort of policy that they think would be necessary for their um, uh, citizens. And so uh, that would be an example of a paid family leave, for instance, that would build on the Federal Family and Medical Leave Act, but um, would, there are nine states that have adopted their own state-level policy for that. I'll show you some examples of different policies that we're considering. And um, again, we have about 50 that are on our list. But within these policies, there's a range of those in which we know a lot about them. They've been well studied, and we can tell you whether they're effective or not as effective as we want them to be. There are others in which folks are trying them, but the studies haven't been very strong in order to really make a causal link between that policy and particular outcomes. And then there are others in which um, the theory of change is incredibly strong. We know that this is an area that um, families need help, but um, states are either just implementing them or they haven't been studied quite yet. An example of that is our fair work scheduling policies, which give a two-week notice uh, for um, workers to know what their schedule is going to be so that they can arrange for child care and be able to anticipate what their income will be over the course of a month or, or weeks. Um, and there are several states that have just recently adopted this. There are several cities that have adopted these policies and strong evaluations are in place. So we're waiting for that sort of information to come. But that is going to be the case as we look across policies is that um, some will have a strong evidence base and some we're going to have to build. And, uh, and that's our third criteria is that in order for us to actually say something about it, someone had to have studied it. And evidence-based policy making is actually a pretty high bar. It requires, again, that someone tried a policy with no information really about how effective it was going to be. Maybe there was a pilot, but maybe they just had a good idea, but they put it into place. And fortunately, they actually put a rigorous evaluation into place as well so that we could learn from it. And then it had to work because uh, a lot of things that we try don't turn out the way that we intend. So um, this bar that we're looking for, of someone's tried it, we've studied it, and that it's effective is a pretty high bar. Um, and uh, But that's what we're looking for in order to make conclusions about how effective policies are. We are, um, to determine how effective a program is, the field is pr uh, pretty much in agreement about how we look at studies and say this program has evidence that it's effective or not. For policies, it's a bit different. I'm not going to go into all the details, but at the end of the day, uh, we will review each policy and then be able to say whether there's um, strong evidence that this is an effective policy, whether there's only moderate or promising evidence to, at this point, or whether we really need to learn more um, so that we could build this evidence base. There will be some in which uh, we'll try them and they won't turn out the way that we wish that they were. Um, fortunately, there's very few that have actually negative impacts on folks. So from this clearinghouse, from this review and comprehensive reviews of policies, our goal is to create a discrete list of policies that will go on what we're calling our prenatal to three state policy roadmap. And this will be 10 to 12 different policies that will span across these different areas that I mentioned earlier of healthy beginnings and strong families and quality care environments. 
And um, our plan is to both measure a state's progress toward adopting those policies and to also measure their progress on a corresponding implementation and outcome measures. That will show us whether uh, we are kind of making the change that, um, that a state may intend. That the policies will be linked uh, within that logic model, so you'll be able to say if this is our goal of creating better health for moms, and this might be the policy that we want to prioritize. If our goal is to create greater income, these might be the policies that we prioritize. But over time, it will create the system of care for families that um, should strengthen them to strengthen the conditions in which children thrive. Um, we are, uh, I, to give you just as an example of one policy, a state earned income tax credit, these are the types of information that we will be providing um, for each of the policies that's on the roadmap, plus, um, plus some additional information as well. But uh, for those of you who are not familiar, a state earned income tax credit is typically a percentage of the federal earned income tax credit. 29 states offer a refundable state earned income tax credit. And the EITC is a policy that is designed to incentivize work among low-income um, workers, that the more that you work, the more you get back in your tax um, credit up into a certain level that plateaus, and then over time, as your income rises, the tax credit phases out at a pretty high level of income. And states have uh, attached their um, credit to that federal credit, usually offering some sort of percentage of that. And so what we're going to do is to say, um, so has a state adopted this policy or not? What are the elements? What does it look like in your state? And then what's the status toward that? A policy is a long game, and it can take several different legislative sessions for a policy to be changed. Um, even if it's a small p policy like a regulation, that can still take time. So we will get to understand within states what it is that you are considering, um, how you're moving the mark on these different policies, that if these are your goals, um, over time. And like I said, we will also be tracking both implementation and outcome measures that are associated with these policies so we can see how the dominoes fall. So for this policy, the evidence says that what it does is it gets more folks into the labor market um, so that they have higher earnings and that children will be less likely to live in poverty. Um, we could have a longer discussion about the needs of child care that this uh, brings about and so forth, that that's going to be something important that why we want to look at the system of care. But for this policy, these are the things that we would be tracking. I'll give you some examples um, across states of what it might look like. So here are four states with different policy contexts for the state in earned income tax credit. Florida um, does not have a state income tax like Texas doesn't either. Uh, that's where I'm from. And um, so they don't actually have a state earned income tax credit as well. South Carolina has a very generous state EITC. It's up to 62.5% of the federal, and it will go up to 125% of the federal um, earned income tax credit by 2023. However, it's not refundable. And because the way that a tax credit works is that it reduces the tax burden that you owe if it's not refundable, or it comes back to you if it is refundable, um, because so many of our families don't owe taxes, a non-refundable one doesn't quite get you um, the same uh, effect that the others do. The research is pretty clear that it's the refundable nature of it that makes a difference. Nebraska has one that is uh, very modest at 10%, and New Jersey has one that's quite more generous at 40%. And like I said, then we would also track some of the implementation measures and outcome measures that are associated with this policy. For instance, this is the percentage of children who are under age three, or infants and toddlers, who have a mom who isn't married, but that is in the uh, labor force. So she's looking for a job um, or is employed. And um, we'll be able to compare states so that they can see where they are uh, relative to the US average. And they can look within their state to see the differences by race and ethnicity and other socioeconomic statuses over time that we will add into this uh, for information. Um, you can see a, a 
a wide variation in labor force participation um, among African American mothers, Hispanic mothers, and white mothers. Um, and you can see that in some states, labor force participation is well below average, um, whereas in other states, like Nebraska, the labor force participation um, of moms with young kids is actually um, quite above average. So this is a type of information that each state would have, and um, over time, we'll be able to show how you change um, these as, as we look in, in years to come. For some of the outcome measures that we might look at for a caregiver outcome measure, the more you work, the more you earn. So we would be looking at the household income or median earnings or other sorts of um, outcomes that would show us how income is improving within a household. And for a child measure, since we know that child poverty is um, directly linked to negative outcomes for children, that we want to monitor how our uh, our policy changes lead to changes in child poverty. Um, and you can see, again, there's large discrepancies by race and ethnicity, and, vari and uh, there's variation across states. And what our, the hope is is that the more that states adopt policies that um, are aimed at uh, these sorts of goals that the state might have, say, of reducing child poverty, that we would see the rates of child poverty for that state uh, decline. So that is just a, a really kind of rough example of the type of information that you will be uh, that we're going to be providing for each state um, on this roadmap. The third resource that we're providing to the uh, field is our policy research exchange. We are in the process of reaching out to um, prenatal to three leaders in all of our states, and by leaders I mean those of you who are legislators or legislative staff, those of you who are agency heads, coalition leaders, um, funders, those folks who really understand what it is that's happening in the states, what it is that states would like to be doing, and the challenges that states are facing. And the goal is to share this information among states to help them learn from each other, and also to share this information back with academics that um, the hope is that the research that we produce will be more relevant and useful for states so that, and it would incorporate the implementation challenges and the realities that many states face as they try to implement these policies. Um, it will also allow us to update the roadmap with uh, real-time information about where you stand toward policy adoption and to make sure that the information that we have, that we see in some of the national data sets is reflective of what you experience in the state. And over time, we may work together to try to collect data that would better inform the roadmap. We'll have an annual summit that will bridge policy and research um, so that we understand what's most effective um, in terms of policies, what states are doing, and what the state of the art is in our research. That might inform both of those. And finally, our fourth resource is to try and help um, develop the policy research agenda for the field. As I said, there's a lot of information um, that we still need to know about what is most effective at creating the system of care for our infants and toddlers and their parents. And so as we do these comprehensive reviews, we pay attention to what we miss and um, you know, what, what we're not actually measuring, uh, what's missing from that evidence base, and then we want to work collaboratively to, with others um, to try and build that evidence base. Um, and as you states are putting into place different policies, we want to work with you to try to um, get an evaluation in place so that we can make sure that we're um, understanding really what works for kids. So I just want to um, close out by um, commenting on the wonderful group of people who have agreed to come along with me on this journey. Uh, we have a National Advisory Council that um, is comprised of folks with a variety of perspectives and experiences, and um, that they provide this ongoing feedback to help to make sure that we're um, making good decisions, that we're staying on track, and um, it is a, um, a wonderful group of folks that are um, telling me when I'm doing things that are good, but also telling me when I should be really paying attention 
to um, additional things. And so I, I so appreciate their uh, feedback. And uh, you may recognize some of the names on here, but they are folks who are working at the state level um, in state agencies. There's former state legislators. There's folks who have experience working at the federal level in different administrations. There are folks who are academics and funders. Um, and we're just very fortunate to have this range of perspectives from uh, conservative and liberal to um, the kind of different views about what they think is most important. And together, we are um, really kind of working toward trying to be this resource uh, for you. As we move forward, um, we're going to be reaching out to those of you uh, who are in states, and I see um, you know, how many different states are rec uh, represented here on this call, and I'm excited to connect with you. We, like I said, we want to find out what you're doing. We want to find out how we can be a resource for you, um, and uh, we want to understand what your challenges are as well. We have a, uh, you're the first to see it, but please save the date um, for our inaugural conference uh, on September 14th and 15th here in Austin. It probably won't be 100 degrees then, hopefully not, but it will be nice and warm, I'm sure. Uh, but the idea for this conference is to be able to bring together our researchers, our policymakers, our um, folks who are on the ground implementing policies, our advocates, funders, those who are all trying to move the mark in this space will identify some of the groundbreaking science that um, we are seeing that is really informing our policy, or should be if it's not yet. We'll uh, share with you what we know about the most effective state-level policies that really bring to life the science of the developing child. We'll be able to explore what states are currently doing uh, with regard to these policies to strengthen these earliest years. And we'll be launching our uh, state policy roadmap so that you will be able to see where your state stands on these uh, different uh, policies and met, uh, implementation and outcome measures. Um, and then as we work with you over time, we'll be able to see the great progress and strides that states make to make sure that our kids get off to a healthy start. So um, I know that our contact information, I think, is provided uh, in other places as well, but I do encourage you to um, connect with us on social media, um, join us uh, for information that we will be sending out as we become more and more um, active and we're launching this more officially. Um, so please uh, connect with us and I look forward to being able to uh, maintain conversations with all of you. And at that, I will um, hand it back to Allison. Awesome. Um, thank you so much, uh, Cynthia. This was wonderful. I hope people can hear me a bit better now. Um, I jotted down a few of the questions that were incoming. Some were just clarified. So if folks have other questions, feel free to enter them. But no, we're going to go through things that I've captured so far. And so I was wondering first, um, Cynthia, on 520, when you were starting to go through the policies, there was a clarifier from Cami in Arizona. Is Head Start considered a policy across, since it, across all three of the columns? Yes. So we are looking at early Head Start because we're inf interested in the um, folks who are under age three. But that is one of the policies that we are reviewing. And it um, certainly cuts across both helping support parents and with health. Um, and to improve their uh, early learning. So, but that is a policy. It's a federal policy, and we're trying to identify the best state leverage out there of you know what type of funding it looks like and how states are doing this um, to make so that more kids are eligible. But yes, early Head Start, but not Head Start um, because it's for the older children. That's great. Thank you. I've got I've got a mute and unmute myself, so I apologize. Um, okay, another clarifier, we were wondering, um, uh, Yvonne from Texas was asking about some of the outcomes towards the, the later part. She was, seems to be a little unclear about the outcome measures uh, related to an increase in median house income for EITC. Does that make any sense as a question for you to clarify what we might be asking about? If not, well, maybe Yvonne uh, could type some more. 
Sure, that would be great. If uh, if I don't get it right, please let me know. That was just an okay. illustrative, you know, to be illustrative, not to, um, that's not the final thing that we will be doing. But the idea here is that for each of the 10 to 12 policies that we include in our state policy roadmap, for each one, we will have a corresponding implementation measure. So let's say that it's extending health insurance. That might be that we're wanting to see the proportion of childbearing aged women who are covered by health insurance. That might be an implementation measure. And then there'll also be a, um, an outcome measure, hopefully a parent outcome measure and a child outcome measure. Those are so, inter you know, so linked, it's, sometimes you can't uh, separate them. But for instance, um, that for expanding health coverage might be a reduction in maternal mortality and a uh, reduction in low birth weight or preterm babies. So each policy is going to have its own um, implementation measure and outcome measures that are associated with it. With the idea that if these are the goals that you have to improve um, the health of babies during the prenatal, perinatal period or to improve family income, that you would be able to see how the, the most effective policies that are aligned with those outcome goals that you would have. Hopefully that made sense, but um, if not, then I will be happy to clarify further. Okay, that's great. Yeah, hopefully Yvonne, that gets at the point. And if not, um, we'll have our contact information up on the following slide. If there are questions we don't have an opportunity to get to, I will also be happy to sort of compile all the questions with some answers uh, and send it back out to everyone that's on the line. I think next, I just wanted to make a few sort of statements that I saw, Cynthia, and just give you an opportunity if you wanted to respond at all to any of the comments that were coming through during the time you were presenting. So um, there is a comment from uh, Brenda in Kansas about breastfeeding on two, on two occasions, she men mentioned breastfeeding. And so I guess we're wondering if you have any thoughts about that. And then the other thing that came up with housing and how maybe that plays a role uh, in some of the policies you're looking at. Um, so I wonder, Cynthia, if you want to take a second to sort of talk a little bit maybe about breastfeeding and housing. Absolutely. Thank you for those questions. So um, with breastfeeding, the um, on our larger list that I didn't share with you, it has about 50 different uh, policies on there. Uh, one of them is about strategies to improve breastfeeding among those women who uh, choose to do that and how to make that so that it's more uh, accessible and, and simpler. It's also an outcome for things like paid family leave, for instance. Um, that's something that has been studied uh, for, for that policy. So that will be something that we are uh, looking at and we'll have information to provide on. Um, I just didn't include it here in, in the presentation. And with regard to housing, um, that, if you kind of think back to the logic model, that fits into the material well-being bucket, that stable housing is something that we know is extremely important, and that the um, time in uh, children's lives in which they're most likely to experience housing disruption is in the prenatal to three period. Um, we have kids when we have the least resources <laughs> over time. Those resources often... Um, uh, increase, but when our kids are babies, that's often when we are uh, struggling to get on our feet. And um, with housing insecurity, and it, that is a it's a big problem. What we're trying to figure out is the state leverage, uh, the state policy that's most effective at creating greater stability. Um, eviction policies seem to be the thing that uh, we are looking at most closely, but we are open to other policies that um, folks could recommend that are state policies. Most housing policy is federal to local. Um, and so thinking of what the best uh, state policies are that have been explored uh, is something that we are definitely interested in looking at. Okay, that's great, thank you. Um, I wonder if, um, for those that might have already been to a September summit that you were able to host, how different will the, no, for those that attended something that will be taking place in March, how different will your summit uh, in September look for a participant? So in Texas, there is a pediatric brain summit uh, that is taking place at the end of March. 
Uh, Jack Shonkoff will be talking, and uh, that summit is really geared toward um, helping folks understand the science of the developing child, as well as this year it's uh, geared a lot toward thinking about how pediatricians and other physicians can be engaged in the conversation of uh, identifying children's needs and connecting them to the resources that they need. So the um, kind of focus of that conference, uh, we're both interested in the science of the developing child for sure. Um, ours will be a little bit broader in terms of what the research is saying about brain development, about um, how um, stress and adversity impact the child's uh, growing body, and other sorts of uh, science, groundbreaking science that will impact policy decisions. And we're going to spend a lot more time focused on um, what the effective policies really are and how they vary across states and what states are learning um, as they're trying to implement uh, these policies. So ours will be um, somewhat different, I think. That's great. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, would either of those be live streamed or is there a way, you know, for, for folks that are on the line interested if they wanted, they weren't in Texas, but will there be any portion of presentations that we might be able to send through those that are on the webinar today so they could tune in or will it be, you know, by invite only? Um, I don't I don't know the answer for the March conference. I know it's not invite only. It is open to folks, um, and I I'm not even sure if there's a registration fee. If it is, it's nominal. And but I'm sorry that I don't have the I'm not hosting it, so I don't know the answer to the live stream or the recording. Um, for the one in September, it will uh, not have a, a fee to come. So it obviously costs to get to Austin, but everyone is welcome. And uh, we are going to see how we can incorporate either live stream or recording so that this information can be shared uh, more broadly for those who can't come. Well, that's excellent. So everyone on the line, um, when I, I'll send out some additional information after the fact, including some of our questions and answers, resources, um, the archive copy of the webinar, and then um, information on the upcoming September summit for those that might be interested. Uh, I guess, Cynthia, I was kind of curious, we, Madeline um, from uh, Child Trends was asking, it would be great to hear you touch on what effective communication with policymakers across the political spectrum looks like in the zero to three space. So the real question is, what strategies are most helpful in eliciting change? Do you have any thoughts that you might want to share to that question? Yeah, I really appreciate the question. And um, Allison, you at NCSL are some of the um, experts on communicating complex information to policymakers so that it is um, something that they can act on and understand and understand both the rational and reason for for doing it and um, kind of the best approach for doing it. So uh, I don't pretend to be the expert on that. Um, I A couple of points that I think are important to make is that um, we our goal is to present the evidence as clearly and concisely and um, succinctly as possible to uh, those who need it and are seeking information to try and figure out what, what the most effective strategies are to meet their goals. Um, we are not making recommendations or advocating for any particular policies. Um, as a academic, I think, and at a, you know, research uh, university, that it's not my place necessarily to tell folks uh, what they should do, but um, I can tell them what the science says about what children need and that uh, if they share the goals that I have, what the most effective strategies are for getting there. But there are going to be others who are experts at the communication um, about how best to present this to uh, the law legislators or um, state leaders. Um, you know, we we will certainly be there to present uh, the science as clearly as possible or the evidence as clearly as possible, but we will love to partner with others who are really expert at making those cases um, that to use the information that, that we're providing. I'm not sure if, if that answered the question or not, um, but uh, what what we're finding is that across the country, state leaders are more and more convinced 
that this is an important period in which we need to invest in children, that if we do it now, that it does set the stage for lifetime health and well-being. And if we don't, uh, it is costly for both the individual and we as a society, and that they are looking for effective strategies. And so hopefully if we um, can educate more and more folks about how important the earliest years are, um, that they will be seeking to do what is most effective and uh, that we'll be able to provide that information. Okay, thank you. I wonder um, in the 20, can you guys hear me all right? Uh, in the 2016 amendment to the Child Abuse Prevention and Treatment Act um, regarding plans for safe care for infants and parents caregivers, um, is this a policy that I guess, are, is this a policy that you're looking at with your review? So that's a um, that goes into this uh, kind of area of we know that this is coming, um, but we're it hasn't been implemented f enough yet that there seems to be enough evidence about what the right combination or strategies are to make it the, to, that that are the most effective um, within that policy area. Uh, states are required to choose. Uh, evidence-based programs, or at least largely, um, so we know that those and th those aren't things that we're evaluating. Those will be things that would have been evaluated through other means. Um, but we are really watching to see what we can learn uh, from this shift in uh, how to best serve infants and toddlers and their parents uh, in the child welfare system. So. It's a long way of saying more to come, but uh, but a really important policy area, obviously. Thank you. Ken, I hope you were still on the line. That was Ken from California who had asked that question uh, a bit earlier, and I wanted to get to it. I think we have one other question. Um, are safe baby courts being included in the assessment of effective programs? Yeah, that's something that I hadn't actually looked at yet, so I'm going to look into that. I saw that question come through, and um, I will look into that and see what, what we can do. And I just welcome these sorts of um, suggestions because I do not have all the answers for what is the most effective in terms of you know, in terms of what everyone is doing or what's out there. Um, and there are some things I probably should know about that I don't and others that um, – you know, I uh, we're learning from folks, and so please send me your suggestions of things that you would like for us to conduct reviews on. Well, that's great. Thank you, Elizabeth, who looks like is from Texas and a child advocate, so maybe if you guys aren't connected, this will be a way for you to get connected. Um, we've got just a few more minutes left. If, if anyone has any additional questions, this would be your opportunity to type them in. Um, while I give the chat box a second to see if there are any final questions, I actually wonder in this, I don't know how, how quick the response is, but I'm sort of curious, uh, Cynthia, for those on the line, you know, if a policymaker wanted to start to move the needle on prenatal to three policy in their state, I'm just curious, you know, it's, it, there's, there's a lot of stuff to look at, but I'm wondering, are there a good first step or uh, an unlikely person that folks on the line should consider connecting with to start the conversation? Just any thoughts you might have around how to start the process in your state? Well, there is a lot of great work that's been go doing, going on in the states right now, and most states have um, coalitions in which they have been bringing together folks. Um, in my observation, a lot of it has focused largely around child care uh, because there's such a, a strong need for high quality child care across our country. Our parents have to work. Our kids need safe environments um, that need they need to be affordable. I, I, I'm not suggesting that that isn't important in any way, but to expand those coalitions to think more broadly about uh, the child's health and the family's um, both their knowledge and skills about children's development, but also their access to resources. Um, that that's kind of this this combination of folks that uh, we need to bring to the table simultaneously. I've also found that, um, at least in, in our my experience, is that um, often the healthcare providers or pediatricians or obstetricians. Um, 
they and our child care providers um, could probably find better alignment, that they are serving the same kids. All, all of our kids go to their well child visits. Not all, but that is a place where so many of our kids who are vulnerable really are. And to be able to um, build stronger connections between where all of our children are and the other institutions that will serve them, um, I think that that's a really important place to start as well. Thank you. I appreciate that. And it looks like we did just get one other question, and only because her name's Allison and so is mine, I'm going to ask it. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so <laughs> Allison, oh, here a few more come. But uh, you alluded to this earlier, but I'm wondering about the exploration of how policies interact. As you implement policies to increase income, family lost multiple, as families lose multiple benefits, they are caught in limbo, which perpetuates poverty, what are you exploring the interaction of policies on family well-being? So this sounding maybe benefit Cliffy? And yeah, I apologize yeah. if the sound is not great. No, um, that's a, a something that we're grappling with quite a bit. In research, the goal is always to isolate the effect of one thing and hold everything else constant so we can see if we did, if we did this one thing, what is the change uh, in our outcome? That's how research is really set up. And to think about policies and how they interact with each other is a question that we are going to continue to push on, uh, but it, the information to date isn't as clear as it needs to be. Um, we do have some examples of times in which there's unintended consequences when we will do one thing and we'll get that outcome, but it kind of you know, whack-a-moles into something else that uh, we didn't intend and we have to pay attention to that. With the benefits cliff, um, this is an issue that is often studied in several of our policies that are aimed at increasing the resources in, in our household. So that's part of our comprehensive reviews where we will be um, able to say, you know, it it does increase household income, um, but after tax and transfers, uh, the uh, increase is not quite as much. The earned income tax credit does that, where it does overall, on average, increase household income. But be, when your income goes up, then your SNAP benefits may go down. Um, and we have some benefits in which there's a real threshold effect. So you make $1 more and you're no longer eligible. Um, these are really important uh, contexts that we're going to be trying to spell out in our reviews. Um, but there's kind of two different things. One is how they affect other benefits. But then two, the question is, if you have multiple policies, is that actually better, right? So that's that's our theory, but we haven't actually um, tested that empirically to say if you had all 10 or 12 of these policies in place, that the kids are going to be um, that much more better, kind of exponentially, not just additive. Um, so those are all things that we are trying to explore. So I appreciate that question. Perfect, thank you. Um, and Nancy, we'll send some information. I want to be cognizant of the time here, and we are at the top of the hour. Um, I want to make sure everyone on the line knows that annually NCSL holds a large summer event. This year, we're going to be going to Indianapolis, and I hope some of you on the line will have an opportunity to join us at, at NCSL's Legislative Summit. And then this slide right here, and I'll keep this up as the, as the presentation ends, uh, I want to give a big thanks to Cynthia for joining us, a really big thank you to the Pritzker Children's Initiative for their support, and a, an especially large thank you to everyone who participated today and for making this webinar as interactive as a webinar can be by asking such great questions and comments throughout. Uh, we will have an archive of the webinar available shortly on our website, and I will certainly send that out to everyone on the line today. At the conclusion of the webinar, you're going to see a brief survey pop up on your screen. It won't take you but a few minutes to fill out, and if you take the time to do it, uh, my colleagues and I would really appreciate that. If you have any remaining questions in addition to what we have in the chat box, but if you do have any remaining questions, please feel free to connect with um, the ECE team. You can see our contact information here. Um, the slide deck also had Cynthia's contact information, which we can share again if needed. And remember, uh, to those legislators and staff on the phone, NCSL is here for you. We are your organization. So we'll be happy to provide you with additional research, resources, or follow-up information that may be helpful to you in the work you do to support infants and toddlers. 
So please connect and stay in touch with us. And with that, thank you, everyone, and have a great afternoon.